But however logical or illogical the connections are between Darwinism and Nazism, historically the connections are there and they cannot be wished away. Welcome to Darwin Denied, the essential bookshelf. Uh, what we're doing is we're going through um, books that we think are critical to the um, uh, to the creation evolution debate for those Christians who want to be well informed about um, about all the issues that are relevant to the uh, the debate over Darwinism, and um, and so today the book that I'm introducing is this one by Richard Weikert, and it's called From Darwin to Hitler, a little provocative title. From Darwin to Hitler. The subtitle is Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany. Now, for a number of reasons, this is a uh, a very sensitive and raw topic. Because of, and we're sometimes tempted to think, well, because of political correctness. But no, there's a, more than a century's worth of uh, raw emotions over this. Uh, Darwin published uh, Origin of Species in 1859, mm -hmm. right? 1859. And that unsettled a bunch of people because they saw the implications of, of it, even though he's just talking about birds and, you know. Uh, it was a general macro theory. A, a, a bunch of people saw the implications for the human race. Mm -hmm. And Darwin didn't go into print on that until like 1871 in his right. publication of The Descent of Man. Man. Right. Uh, and at that point, Darwin went on the record saying, what I've been saying about the evolution of various species uh, does not exclude man. Right. Uh, we're we're part of the show. We're part of the whole. Um, uh, we're part of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the implications of this are um, uh, are troubling for those who have concerns about racism, racial um, uh, racial theories. And when you look online, if you say was you know if you type into your search bar was Charles Darwin a racist, um, you'll have some stuff come up, and some defenders of Darwin, friends of Darwin, will say, well, unfortunately, he was a man of his times, right, right, that kind of thing, um, and so he shared some of the uh, racial biases of of his time. But the thing that people are not coming to grips with is that um, his theory is. Um, I would argue necessarily and inexorably racist, right. um, and and so it was not just an unfortunate fact that he was a Victorian Englishman who participated in certain um, racial bigotries. It was part and parcel with the whole right. uh, part and parcel with his whole outlook. Now, uh, this book from Darwin to Hitler shows that uh, I'll just. Um, read a, a, a quotation. In philosophical terms, Darwinism was a necessary but not a sufficient cause for Nazi ideology. But however logical or illogical the connections are between Darwinism and Nazism, historically the connections are there and they cannot be wished away. Mm. Um, and this book is just crammed full of historical documentation showing how the Nazis were um, full-throated evolutionists. They mm -hmm. embraced the whole thing, right. uh, and they applied it. And they applied it with cruel, cruelty and malice, but that's what they were applying. Right. Uh, he, Weikert says that he makes a distinction between necessary and sufficient um, uh, causes. If something is necessary, it means without that thing, you won't have the other thing. Mm -hmm. A sufficient cause is with this thing, you will have the uh, other thing. So, uh, without Darwinism, you can't have Nazism. With Darwinism, you may or may not have uh, Nazism. So, but not, you can still have racism without. Yeah, I would say Darwinism necessitates Darwin. racism. Right. But you don't have to have a philosophy of extermination. Let's say. Right. All right. So what happened was, um, and this is a, a lot of people have done a lot of walking back or backpedaling. Um, and that uh, after Darwin published um, Origin of the Species, a gentleman named Herbert Spencer uh, came up with the phrase social Darwinism. Mm -hmm. Okay, where you took the um, 
you took the tenets of bi the biological theory and you applied it to human history, competition mm -hmm. between nations, right. and, and, and so forth. So uh, Spencer was an ardent Darwinist, and he applied uh, the biological theory to human social interactions. Uh, and some people say, well, see, that was, uh, that's not what he should have done, and that's too bad. But here's a quote from Darwin himself. This is Darwin. The Western, is this from this, uh, I think Descent this of Man? Descent or? of Man. The Western nations of Europe now so immeasurably surpass their former savage progenitors that they stand at the summit of civilization. The civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races through the world. Well, so um, Darwin believed in evolutionary progress, and he believed that that evolutionary progress applied to mankind. Right. And he belie believed that it, it applied to the the differentiated races or mm -hmm. uh, tribes um, among mankind. Now, his his one tree of life in his first book shows a branching tree where you have um, one species and uh, populations diverging and um, being subject to different selection pressures. And so mm -hmm. those two populations which which were or are one species are starting to to diverge. Now, a lot of times they diverge and they they are in a different niche so right. that they can coexist. Right, and that's why you have it be a branching tree, not a linear tree. Right. So, but if if those two populations that eventually uh, uh, reach a species status, so they're no longer one but two, um, and they're trying to occupy the same niche, then I could. Then it's then direct that's when it's direct competition, and that's why you'd say, you know, it's going to replace and exterminate the others. But if they're such that they're in a diff different, completely different niche, going after different resources, then mm -hmm. um, I think his own diagram shows that it doesn't have to be an extermination thing Un until you get to a certain population size so right and then you're going to have inevitable yeah. conflict yeah inevitable. so right so here's this is this would be the thing it would seem to me that um if if darwin believed in progress evolutionary progress mm -hmm. um and he as he did then you've got the concept of superior inferior mm -hmm. right um, you could have a theory of evolution that denied progress, and the only value was, are you continuing to survive? Right, and and that's sort of the kind of Darwinism that's ex more today. They still say that some things can advance be if there's a selection pressure, but there's no, because today they've sort of worked out the inconsistencies. They would say there's no there's no thing that's propelling you for advancement. Right. Um, that you can evolve downward, upward, whatever. Sideways. Sideways, whatever makes it. So instead makes of a you crazy. Survive, it's, it's, it's just survival of the fittest. And that fittest doesn't need to be more advanced. It can be, it's like a car, a race car can be more fit if you strip it of unnecessary weight. You can subtract from it and make it faster. So it's all about survival ability, not right. advancement. I think in the more of the 19th century or early 20th century, it was much more of a, a progressive uh, notion right. of Darwinism, whereas today it's like whatever works, works. Right. Except that... But... Oh, go ahead. Well, except that um, mankind has to think in terms of praise and blame. And I think they've not been as successful in exterminating the idea of progress as they like to think, because we could, um, it, it, on paper, it's as though they shifted from a graded class, A plus, A, uh, A minus, B plus, and so forth, to mm -hmm. simply pass fail, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And so the evolutionary tree is uh, failing, is dying and your genes not reproducing. Mm -hmm. And we could all evolve back to a planet full of cockroaches. Yeah, or bacteria. Or, or bacteria. And so long as the genes continue to perpetuate, right. you're, pa you're passing the class. 
mm -hmm. right, right? If there's a nuclear war and we all mutated back to some kind of Or, or yeah, all of the smart big things that couldn't fit into little cracks right. died. Died. And so, um, yeah, it, it's all about what, what in the environment selects, you know, that's why it's called natural selection. Nature sort of uh, selects which, which population is more fit. And so, but what's interesting about this whole, today you've got this tension, you've got back in the early days of Darwinism, um, there was racist implications and there was some pushback, but not anywhere near the pushback today because you had this other movement called political correctness. Well, it was actually the um, uh, it, it was the Nazis who um, who made it unpopular. Who made eugenic basically eugenics before World War II. Uh, eugenics is a Darwin it happened in U.S. You know? Oh yeah, it was, yeah, it was happening with putting Otabenga, the the African pygmy in the uh, in the, zoo. the Bronx Zoo. Right, um, and then there was just enough of an outcry that they finally put a stop to that. But you have you have these things popping up, but when you see the full-blown version of it in uh, in the Nazis, then yeah. it's... It, everybody recoiled, right? So, so, and they said, oh my gosh, that's where that goes. Uh, but now we're a good uh, generation out from World War II. The memory is... A couple, is uh, couple generations, uh, yeah. Well, it's, we still have yeah. veterans of that war, you know, people right. who remember it, um, uh, alive today. And but the memory's fading fast, and eugenics is starting to make a comeback. Mm -hmm. um, and and giving uh, and given the premises of the tree of life, you can breed dogs, you can breed yeah. horses, you, you can, can breed, breed anything. You can breed anything for certain characteristics. Right. You can make some dogs dumb. You can make or some or dogs smart, smart, and you can make some dogs more adaptable to survival down the road and so and and given the relative comparison of this dog is smarter swifter better than this dog maybe there's because uh, darwinism is not ne necessarily relativistic in an absolute sense mm -hmm. uh, you have to retreat to the comparative sense where mm -hmm. this dog is a better retriever or this dog is a better yeah, uh, uh, border collie kind of that, type that of That won't dog. fly in. That won't fly very well in the political. Cra so are but, you? But what I'm saying that we're an animal. Why can't you breed for us? Right. Right. Why can't we be bred for? So people? there's going to be with this movement where you're saying that um, eugenics is coming back. Uh, won't won't there be a big clash between that movement and? political correctness and how will you see that uh, clash no I think will it res I think the politically correct people are the secularists they're the evolutionists and they're the ones who are going to flip and the people who are going to stay steady are the creationists the mm -hmm. people who believe in God because right. the implications basically I think that the implications of Darwin as uh, Weikert shows, um, and all the early first-generation Darwinians were this way. They accepted the implications yeah, right. of the uh, the white races, the civilized European races were ahead of, according to their premises, were right. ahead of Africa. Right. Okay, and so we had every right to dominate, every right to colonize, etc. Mm -hmm. And of course, for Christians um, who believe that, that Adam and Eve were the Father and mother of all, all of us, right? Uh, Asians, blacks, whites, and uh, every, they, every so that yeah, or actually not only Adam and Eve, but Noah and his wife were the progenitors yeah, of, of everybody, everybody and of their kids everybody. and their kids' wives. And so the Christian, the creationist, looks at a Nigerian or Chinese as in the image of God, as, as an image, of, not only as being in the image of God, but as my cousin. Right. Okay. This this person is my cousin. Uh, the Darwinian sees that you've got a certain number of organisms competing for limited resources. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be better at that competition than others. That's right. where Spencer's right. survival, uh, um, uh, Spencer's social Darwinism, and I think he came up with survival of the fittest also. Um, you'll have this necessary implication that one developmental race of Homo sapiens 
could be ahead of, better right. equipped. I mean, that's the that's the logic. But the the whole so you'll you'll say that the political correct movement will eventually see that they're not being consistent with their premise, and they'll eventually um, yeah. pack yes. up and and I, and, I, and capitulate to the to the. Um, the inexorable logic of of Darwinism of Darwinism because Darwinism basically um, requires us to say that comparatively on the race yeah. for resources, one group can be ahead of the other group. Exactly, and there's no trait that is immune to selection. So Correct. we're we're fine at least with animals. We can say okay, every trait. Um, there's nothing that's off the board for selection, whether it's mm -hmm. skin color, fur color, hair color, eye color, um, body shape. All of those things are, um, uh, from a Darwinian perspective, are moldable by natural selection, including intelligence. That's not off the board. But as soon as you get to humans, everybody starts getting nervous. All of a sudden, um, we say, "Yeah, we get nervous and we say, okay, now.' Why is it so flexible with all these other creatures and plants? Right, but you cannot make those. Yeah, uh, so you have the evolutionary inferences. You have the evolutionary tree of life growing, spreading, and one branch going up further and further. And then all of a sudden, we get to humans, and I'll, and someone issues a decree. Okay, from now on, all humans must progress at the same rate." They, right, and no matter how much it branches, no one branch can get right. more um, uppity. Uppity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's sort of immediately, um, sort of the human rights and all of those things, and so you've got these two different. Uh, but there uh, is no God. There yeah, are no human yeah. rights. That's exactly, the <laughs> and so eventually, those types of sensibilities, which are sensibilities that are coming from some kind of Judeo-Christian background, background uh, will either win out, but you, in order for those to win out, you have to embrace the foundation of it, which yeah. is God endowed, in heaven. Endowed by their creator, creator. By, with certain inalienable rights. But and as soon as that, there's no creator, then uh, all bets are off. Things can diverge, speciate. Uh, adaptive radiation, and uh, whether it's animals, plants, humans, um, there's there's right. there's there's no standard by which no, we can condemn or praise right. or blame anything. Um, and uh, there's one. Uh, yeah, George anything. Bernard Shaw was a, 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 a friend of G.K. Chesterton's and a debating partner uh, with Chesterton. And I think mm -hmm. Chesterton did a wonderful job in opposing this eugenics thing before the war. Mm -hmm. And George Bernard Shaw was into eugenics. He was really, um, you know, right. before, before the Nazis discredited it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a woman um, <laughs> one time wrote to George Bernard Shaw and said that um, we could, we should get together, we should hook up uh, on a eugenics basis. And, and the child could have uh, your brains and, and my looks. And Shaw wrote back and said, we can't risk it, ma'am, because it might have your brains and my looks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's hilarious. But, um, the, but the point is that if we're an animal, if we're simply an animal, and if we're just so many pounds of meat, bones, and protoplasm, right. and we have gene genetic characteristics that can be bred, which mm -hmm. we do, you have your grandfather's nose, you have your, yeah. your mother's eyes, um, then why wouldn't we uh, undertake the, uh, an attempt to control right. our evolution? If we understand evolution, if we understand how this works, um, why does it give everybody the creeps to, right. s to, uh, to turn this over to the scientists? Right. To, uh, to but, but even if we're not trying to take the helm mm -hmm. on trying to steer one group of people in one direction and the other. Just from a natural selection standpoint, the nature t taking the helm, whether it's artificial selection and eugenics. You know, we do eugenics with dogs mm -hmm. and eugenics with crops because we're 
we're picking certain races. We're, t- we're taking Dominion. Yeah. We're, yeah. But um, with, the, with the humans, whether it's artificial selection, eugenics, or natural selection, where the environment dictates whether it's better for this population of humans to be more clever than that population, you know, those types of things, those, those, those traits that can actually be controlled by selection, um, for some reason, like we said, uh, are not considered um, fair game yeah. when it comes to humans, unless you think that eventually they will get consistent with now, the idea. Now, suppose um, here's another way of looking at it, because I know that we're going to get if um, this is shown to an evolutionist, he's going to say this is not outra- outrageous slander. Nobody is saying. Uh, nobody today, no reputable no, right. science scientist today, is using evolution as a right. basis for racial. Right, you're theories. going you're going back to an old, old version of Darwinism right. that's Correct. not relevant today. Um, so I'm I would say, all right, um, this would be my reply to that. Um, let's say you had a scientist who uh, a respected scientist who was overtly a racist, and he was appealing to Darwin. Mm-hmm. As the, he, let's say he agreed with us, but he on the racial implications, but didn't agree with us on the creationist side, right? right? So he was he was an, attempting to be a 19th century Darwinian in the 21st century, and let's say that he was ostracized and vilified by all the respectable PC affected Darwinians. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they were disputing his facts and disputing his research and disputing everything. Um, I would I would say, look, uh, he, this guy has postulated that whites are superior to blacks. Let's say right. um, on an evolutionary basis, there is no god; it's strictly strictly science. Mm-hmm. And you're reject. I understand that you reject what he's claiming, right? Um, as a matter of fact, but I want to ask you. Is what he's claiming is that something that could be true? Right. Whether the, his yeah. Well, that's actually happened. James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA, of Nobel, right? No Nobel sl- Prize. No slouch. Fame. No no scientific yeah, yeah. slouch. Right. Uh, he has uh, made some comments uh, about race. Um, yeah, just what you said. Right. Um, whites being superior to blacks. Um, he was asked to retract. Um, he retra- made in a public apology, but then other comments later on uh, yeah. show that he was still hasn't um, changed his he, in, in his brains. He still thinks that. And so um, he's been stripped. Uh, James Watson has been stripped of his uh, some honorary... Um, Degree, uh, like he, Chancellor Emeritus Oliver R. Grace, Professor Emeritus, um, Honorary Trustee. These were stripped from him because he wasn't backing down. He hasn't repented of those implications, those ideas. But like you said, based on Darwinian uh, true. Darwinism, whatever whatever modern permutation of Darwinism, you you um, c- could he be right? Right. Yeah. Um, from from that perspective, and right. you know, uh, it seems like in every other um, animal, um, intelligence can be selected for or against. So why why the double standard? Mm-hmm. And the, I think the. Whether or not um, I'm, I'm not weighing in on um, James Watson's what, what his sources were, why he what's um, he what he's what, pointing is, at because he's not saying that this is just as philosophical implications of his theory. He's saying no, this is what, he, and so I'm not pointing to whether his sources are uh, accurate. The main thing is he's just thinking. Um, He's just thinking through his um, his premise that even if his sources are dubious, it, it's it's yeah, it's it, one this, of those implications that it, should be. Yeah, this is a philosophical issue, not mm-hmm. a research issue. Right. So we could say 
okay, Watson's research was bogus. Let's say he cooked or, all it. Or, or that he, he went to sources that were just not. Yeah, or he right. made them up or whatever. Let's yeah. say Watson could be entirely discredited as a scientist, but I would still say to his critic, what about what he's saying is impossible? Yeah. Right. Given your given your premise, given your shared premise with him, why are you saying that that is an unacceptable outcome? We won't let the science ever go there. Right. Right. Um, and I would say, yeah, you shouldn't let the science go there because uh, we're created in the image of God. God. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. but that that's a separate question. Given your, given, given their, yeah, exactly. given their um, premise, it. it his his point. They shouldn't have any so the, particular uh, issue with. Circling back around to this book from Darwin to Hitler, it's um, it's a intellectual history. So it's Good. it's not a um, it's not a book uh, analyzing the science or analyzing right. the research. Although it he does cover some of the. Um, so it's a sociological uh, a sociological uh, historical study of who said what when. Mm -hmm. And it traces the impact of Darwin in Germany. So uh, Darwin was embraced um, mm -hmm. full, full tilt, yay, hooray, this is going to liberate us from the restrictions of Christianity, right. in, in effect, uh, which it did. And so this is not saying, this is not an ad hominem, if you, I, I should hasten to add, this is not an ad hominem attack on Darwin saying that Darwin was a Nazi. Right. Right. It, it's not it's saying just that, that I have no doubt that Darwin being given his education background and his demeanor and his personality and he was all a Victorian nice, Englishman and he yeah he, all around nice guy. Nice his, nice guy. Loved if, his family. If you showed him the Holocaust, I have no doubt that Darwin would be appalled. Right. Right. Um, but no one little raindrop thinks that it's responsible for the flood. Right. <laughs> right. And, um, and what Weikert shows is that ideas have consequences. Right. His, and, his idea breached a dam. Right. That his, his idea breached a dam, and it was a devastating idea. And, and if uh, those of us who are entering this brave new world of genetic engineering, mm -hmm. uh, lab, um, lab babies, um, all the, yeah. the messing around that people are doing, by scientists who who continue to deny the image of God in man. Uh, we're, we live in an abortion culture. We live in an experiment on the kids in the lab right. culture. We live in uh, fertilization culture where we fertilize a number of eggs and then give the parents two and wash the others down the sink. The, all well, they of, usually oh, just keep them in the freezer. But right. yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's anything a, goes if you don't have absolute morality. Right. So this, this is a book to scare you. This is a book that will curl your hair. This, <laughs> this is yeah. a book that will... Pin your ears you, back. Pin your ears back. <laughs> and it will show you, it, it will demonstrate, I think, in a, um, uh, in a compelling way, why and how this debate over Darwin is not indoor entertainment. Right. It's, it, it's it, not just an intellectual, you know... Racquetball. Yeah, it's, yeah. This there are high stakes. Um, there are millions of people dead because, because of the implications. Because of the implications. The ramifications of the theory. Exactly. Your chances of surviving the first day of the Normandy Beach invasion are radically, radically superior to your chances of surviving spiritually your um, your time at college. Approximately seventy percent of those students who were engaged in church activity in high school have ceased being engaged in church activity by the end of their freshman year in college. Colleges spending ridiculous amounts of money on um, accoutrements for their campus that make it more like a spa resort experience than an actual academic experience. And so you can float the lazy river um, while you're um, living off of your student loans and you see how how little that, that has to do with the actual, um, the actual classroom. When the federal government starts to say, okay, here's what your bathroom needs to look like, here's how the showers have to work, here's the um, diversity training that everybody has to go through, here's the, and you get all of this regulation that starts to come out, you'll find the colleges are going to hop to pretty quickly to do what they need to do in order to keep that money coming. 
Is your priority, well, I need to be employable. I need to have this job. Or is your priority, I need to glorify God, to think critically, and to argue with this person in a persuasive way, and engage them, and glorify God in a, in a way where I'm acting with integrity. If your whole goal in life is to get a job, you're a cog in somebody else's machine. You do what is necessary to keep your job on paper while preserving a quiet little space in your heart where you allow yourself to remember the difference between boys and girls. And this is the compromise that Christians are making again.